Good morning, friends. Welcome to UPC Sunday Morning Worship. Today, we welcome back George Hinman, Pastor George. He'll be back from sabbatical, and I got a sneak peek, and there's a ton of really amazing photos that are going to just thread his whole message today. We're going to close out this series, God's Great Plans. And hasn't it been an incredible series? I actually went back and, and listened to some of the sermon clips throughout the series. It's so good how it just builds week over week. So um, let's just prepare our hearts as we get ready for that today. The other thing is today we have a healing service. And so at the end of the worship service, there will be elders being called to the front and deacons too. If you would like prayer at any time throughout the worship service or specifically at that time, we can also pray for you online through that blue prayer request button where we'll take you to a private prayer chat room. Or um, you can always email us at prayer at upc.org. This Wednesday, we begin Lent, and it's Ash Wednesday, and the service will be live streamed, and so you'll be able to see it online, or we have it here, and it is, uh, we'll be imposing ashes on people, so um, I'm not sure how that will work online, but it still will be here if you'd like to participate in that way. Next Sunday, we begin groups, so there's a go group, a grow group, and a gather group, and an immerse group. So I've got the book, it's actually quite thin, so it's the last of the six series, um, and so if you still haven't signed up, please do so. You can do that on the event page. And um, that's it. So we will see you at the greeting time. So now let's quiet our hearts and join our friends in the sanctuary and prepare our hearts for worship. Good morning. Our call to worship for this morning comes from the Gospel of John, the first chapter, the 14th verse, which says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Our opening hymn for this morning sings of Christ, that only son, whose glory fills the skies. It's found in our hymnals at number 562, or the words on the screens on either side. As you're able, I invite us to stand together and worship our Lord Jesus. Oh, 
Won't you join me in the prayer of confession? Lord, you desire truth in the inward being. Therefore, teach us wisdom. And may we hold it within our hearts. And Lord, we confess before you today that there are times or there were times throughout the course of this week uh, that we have not been truthful with ourselves. We have not been truthful with our neighbors, our coworkers, or family members. So, Lord, we ask that you would search every crack and crevice of our hearts and if you find anything in us that is contrary to your will, we ask that you would remove it and cast it out into a sea of forgiveness, never to be seen or heard of again. Lord, us, help, us, Lord help us to live, uh, consistently live in the light of your truth. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Brothers and sisters, let us hear these words of pardon, assurance of pardon, but speaking the truth in love, we grew up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Amen. Our next hymn reminds us that in Jesus Christ, we are ransomed, healed, restored, forgiven. I invite us to stand again as we sing number 25. Praise my soul, the King of heaven. Welcome to worship at University Presbyterian Church. Do you remember this face? <laughs> Sorry, apologies, apologies. Oh. Uh, it's so good to be back. If you are new or visiting UPC this weekend, uh, the reason they're clapping is I've been gone for three months 
and, uh, and I've been on sabbatical, and it's just been a wonderful time. And, I have, and we've visited lovely churches along the ways, many warm places filled with spirit. I, I have a better sense of what it is to come through a, the doors as a stranger, as a visitor, and feel welcomed by a warm congregation. But of all the places that we visited, not, nothing like coming home and being here with, with you all. So thank you so much. Had a wonderful sabbatical, great time away. For that, I want to say just thank you. Our whole family says thank you for the gift of time and your generosity in letting us do this. It had been eight years, and I feel very refreshed. I slept so well. And our, three, our themes were uh, adventure, study, and rest, and all of it was great. I'll share a little bit more with you uh, during the message. I wasn't planning on it, but people kept saying, I can't wait for you to tell us about what you've been doing. So I'll share a couple pictures with you uh, today. If you're interested in a report, I have a two-page report that I've written for the elders and deacons, and I'd be happy to share that with you as well. So uh, I think there's a printed report out at the welcome kiosk, or you can send me an email, and, and uh, we'll send that to you. Here at UPC, uh, we're joining Jesus. This is our mission. This is why we exist. We're joining Jesus to transform our lives and the lives of our neighbors. We're on a mission here, and if you're new, uh, welcome. Uh, we wanna make sure that you feel very uh, welcomed here and at home here. If there's anything we can do to help you understand more about what we're called to do and who we are, we wanna help you with that. We would love for everybody to take a moment each Sunday and fill out a connect card. It just helps us know, learn your names and, and know uh, that you're tracking with us and what you're participating in. So if you've done this before, it's just a, you open up your phone, you scan the QR code on the back of the bulletin and just put your name and who's with you worshiping today. And that's super helpful for us as we uh, get to know our church family in a dynamic time. Uh, I also want to say happy Lunar New Year, right? Uh, this is the year of the dragon. So we're celebrating. This is a, you know, like a, a quarter to half of the world's population celebrates Lunar New Year. It's a really, really big deal. It's a time of family, travel oftentimes. And uh, so if you're celebrating Lunar New Year, just know that we're celebrating uh, with you and hope you have a great uh, new year. We had over 200 people on Friday night celebrating the Lunar New Year here at UPC uh, with our, our global friends. Uh, check out the back of the bulletin. We're going to try and spend less time in announcements and just want to point your, uh, draw your attention to the back of the bulletin. You, there you'll see kind of what's going on. One of the things you want to note that is we're, we're, about, we're, we're signing up for small groups this weekend and next weekend. So if you're not in a small group, Lent is starting uh, the 40 days before Easter, and we're doing 16-week uh, small groups this spring. A great way to connect with people, to grow in your faith, and maybe to find ways to serve and love your neighbors. So uh, sign up for a small group and start Instructions on the back of the bulletin there. If you're a college student or young adult, don't forget, we've got our weekly brunch at 12 o'clock noon in Palmer House. Uh, and lastly, uh, today is a healing service, and we do this uh, periodically. We trust God for healing in our lives, and he does miraculous things, sometimes dramatically, sometimes very slowly and gradually. Uh, but we've seen, it's a beautiful expression of the humility of the body of Christ to come forward and be prayed for. So we'll be doing that later on in the service. Be in prayer now. Ask, let's ask the Lord to surface the broken places in our lives and in our world that he might move us forward to be agents of healing as we come and receive anointing for oil uh, towards the end of the service. Well, let's take a moment and uh, see who's around you. I'm sure there's somebody warm. I'd be happy to welcome you to worship today. Uh, if you need a teaser, here's a question. Who are you rooting for today? San Francisco, Kansas City, or Taylor Swift? Would you stand and greet one another? Hey, look who's in here. It's Prentice. Hi, everybody. So Good morning. George, or Pastor George said, who do you want for the Super Bowl? Do you care? Uh, well, I, if I could just say not the 49ers. Uh, <laughs> maybe. maybe. I am too, actually. My niece loves Taylor Swift. So jump into this chat here and tell us who do you want. And if you don't care, that's okay too. You could just say the team wearing red because they're both wearing right. red. That means that you're a winner no matter what. And everybody likes that these days, right? That's right. <laughs> All right, everyone. Well, greet one another. I did not post my virtual hello, but you get one from me, you get one from Prentice, and we will now go back and uh, join the same, uh, our congregation to sing the doxology. Have a nice day. <laughs> Bye, everyone.
Amen. We want to uh, invite our youth to uh, go with their teachers in the back. Amen. One of our youth just gave me a salute like this here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, now is the time for us to uh, worship the Lord through our giving, uh, to give back to him a portion of that which he has given to us because everything that God blesses us with is not always for us, but God wants us to be a conduit uh, that we might be a blessing to others. The two other things we want to do, we want to uh, commission our dear brother, uh, Naji Abi Hashim, uh, he's a faithful uh, member here at UPC. He often sings in the choir. He's a preacher, a missionary, psychologist, uh, just a wonderful man of God. And so he's, uh, as we are praying for him, he's on a flight uh, to Beirut and then to Lebanon. Uh, so let's pray that God gives, gives him traveling grace and that God uh, really blesses his ministry as he ministers in Lebanon. Uh, won't you join me in prayer? Father, we uh, thank you for uh, all that you have given us, that every good and perfect gift comes from you. And so, Lord God, we thank you for blessing us, Lord, uh, with uh, financial resources. Thank you for blessing us with health and strength. Thank you, Lord, for blessing us with family and friends. And uh, so, Lord God, we just ask that you would bless the tithes and offering uh, that would be given, Lord, and we pray that it may be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom. And, Lord, we also lift up our dear brother, Naji. Uh, we thank you, Lord God, for his faithfulness. Uh, we thank you, Father God, for uh, his commitment uh, to make the gospel known. And so, Lord, we pray that you will give him traveling grace. Uh, we pray that you will give him favor along the way, that you will show him glimpses of yourself. And, uh, Lord, we pray that, he, that you will be with him in Lebanon, uh, that you will give him favor with the people. Give him the right words to share, Lord God. And may he represent you well, Father God. And Lord, we come boldly to the throne of grace this morning, knowing that we have a great high priest who can sympathize with all that we could ever go through. And we know that your grace is always sufficient and your mercies are new every morning. And your strength is made perfect in our weaknesses. And like your servant Paul, Lord, may we learn to glory in our weakness because that's where you show up in our lives, dear God. And Lord, we do want to lift up those within our church family. We pray for those uh, who are facing health challenges and recovering from surgery. We lift up our dear, dear sister Marsha, uh, Kay Louise, Ken, Bong, Barb, Kevin, Sandra, Peter, Dave, and Malcolm. And we also lift up Jane and Sue, who are in hospice care. And Lord, we know that there are many others and, and those who are in the sanctuary today who have unspoken uh, prayers and concerns, dear God. And Lord, we pray that you will heal where healing is needed, that you would mend broken relationships, dear God, that you would uh, show yourself, Lord, to be a very present help in time of need. And Lord, we pray for this spiritual climate that we live in, dear God, a climate of retaliation. Uh, we pray, Lord God, for this spiritual climate, dear God, that we may be people of reconciliation, Father God. And Lord, we uh, just pray for this, this year, dear God, this political year, people are running for office, Lord. Uh, we pray for a spirit of love, a spirit of grace, we pray, Father God, for a spirit of peace, Lord. And Lord, we ask that as Christians, Lord, out of all people, that we may be ones who exhibit that grace, that peace, and that love. And now, Lord, we ask that you would teach us how to pray as you taught your disciples by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread 
and forgive us for our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, Wade. Thank you, choir. <laughs> Amen. Oh, so good to be with you. I might be a little bit rusty today, okay? You give me one uh, rusty sermon. I want to share a little bit, as I say, about our experiences uh, during the sabbatical. You'll hear more later as the weeks go by, I'm sure. But more importantly, what I really want to share with you today is, is a promise. And we just sung it, heard it. It's the promise of God that those who seek the Lord will find he has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. He has an adventure for the living of that life. Let's turn to those words in the uh, book of Jeremiah. Uh, would you open up a Bible, navigate on an app, or pull the black book out in the rack in front of you? If you're pulling the pew Bible out, you can turn to page 639. All of us to Jeremiah chapter 29, uh, verses 11 through 14. And if you're able, would you stand? Let's read this aloud together as an act of worship. And when we're done reading, I'll say, this is the word of the Lord, so that if you believe it, you can say thanks be to God. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 14. Listen carefully. You're reading God's holy word. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me. If you seek me with all your heart, I will let you find me, says the Lord. And I will restore your fortunes, gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. This is the word of the Lord. Be Grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord lasts forever. Please be seated. Lord Jesus. When we come to worship you, we usually come because we, need, we know we need something. We, we need a savior. We know we need to hear from our beloved creator and redeemer. And so we come to your written word and we trust to your Holy Spirit that we might meet you, Jesus, the living Christ. Would you move among us this morning to speak to us in the way that each one of us needs to hear and to heal, we pray in Christ's name, amen. Well, notice this. You find yourself where you find yourself because God wants you to find him here. Wherever you are right now. I mean, I can testify how easy it is to get lost in your own life. And here, Israel is having an experience of its own lostness. They're in exile in Babylon. Jeremiah is writing a letter from Jerusalem to God's people there. Good people, but lost people. Faithful people, a remnant, but lost in their own lives. And the Lord is saying to them, essentially, you've gotten yourself lost, but I've got you to this place so that you can find me. I will gather you, the text says, from all the places where I have driven you. Notice, that's interesting. There's a dual agency here. We've gotten ourselves lost, but the Lord is also saying, I've gotten you to this place so that you can find me. It reminds me of the contested spaces of our lives, those places we find ourselves where we're lost, those places of resistance, of willfulness, places where we're not sure we really want a plan from God. Do we even believe in God at all? But these are places, these contested spaces, that are also places of possibility. This is what Jeremiah reminds God's people. This is places where the Lord says to you, I want you to find me right here. When you call upon me, he says, if you seek me, he says. Now a picture of that for me is a door. So just think of a door, a, a, a door, something that will close God out, or something that could let God in. Behind a door is space. And, and this space is encircled by uh, your life, uh, is circled by circumstances, but, it, but it's characterized by closeness or openness at a door. So here's a picture of a door. Uh, this, this door happens to be in Cambridge, England. 
where we spent a month of our sabbatical. This is the door to Ridley Hall. You'd think there'd be more doors, but really Cambridge is a city of walled forts. If you've been there, you've seen that. Little cobblestone streets, but then dozens of colleges, they call them. And they're all medieval little forts, little castle-like. They're surrounded by a wall, and they've got this one door, no drawbridge. I didn't see that anymore. But what you see here is you see two double doors, and then inside of that, like uh, big enough for a carriage, I suppose, to come through. They ne- I never saw the double door open, but they all have this smaller door that f- forces you to kind of bend over and step over at the same time to come into this place. And then you come in, and now you, and for the first time, you can see the college. You see the green and uh, all the living space spaces and classroom spaces uh, around this beautiful open green, which has lots of rules about who's allowed to step on the grass and who's not allowed to step on the grass. But it just reminds me of a fort and a contested space. There's inside space here. And I, I don't think there's anything dangerous now, but I suppose in medieval times there was a real risk there. Now, the only dangerous thing in Cambridge that I found was the bicyclists who are riding, like uh, everyone's late for something, five minutes late, and, uh, and the uh, delivery services on motorbikes that will uh, just run, you, run into you. And of course, they're on the wrong side of the road there. So <laughs> it was terrifying. We'd get back on a, from a bike ride across town and our adrenaline would be f- flooding us. Uh, but we have contested spaces in our lives. Babylon is a contested space. Will we go with plan, God's plans or not? Israel was a contested space. Is this God's city or do we want to be like all the other nations? The whole planet is a contested space. That's the point of the Eden story. Will we respond to the word of the creator, whether it makes sense to us or not? Or will we decide for ourselves what's good or evil? A contested space. Why are there these contested spaces in our lives and in the world? Well, the answer is love. Jeremiah will remind Israel two chapters later in verse 3, chapter 31, I've loved you with an everlasting love. Love makes room for people to say no. Right? Love allows us to respond to that love or not respond to that love. This is what a, a contested space really is. So if I say to you, hey, I'm having a birthday party soon and you have to come, you must come. If you don't come, you won't be my friend anymore. How does that feel? I mean, how, how would that feel for me? I mean, I, not very satisfying for you to come. Or your love interest, you know, that really cute person who's walking across campus from time to time and you've got your eye on them and you go to your therapist because you're so filled with anxiety and the therapist says, hey, actually, that person as one of my clients as well. Um, and I've dabbled in uh, some hypnotism. How about if I hypnotize her or him, and next time you see them, they'll say, honey, I love you, and they'll say that for the rest of their lives, and you can get married to them and live ha- happily ever after. Does that sound, uh, would you do that? He's like, for sure. <laughs> no, no, you would not do that. Because real love, mature love, is free creates the possibility of refusal, of saying no. And God wants that kind of a love with us. It's, it's part of the beauty of who God is and the richness of his love. He, 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 he doesn't compel us to respond. He invites us to respond. The Lord always comes into our lives by invitation. And so those spaces are set up where we have to decide, will we invite him in? Will we, will we choose to want his plans or not for our lives? What I'm saying is you find yourself where you find yourself because God wants you to find him there. For them, the contested space was Babylon. For me, it was Ridley Hall and UPC and my own midlife and other pockets of space in my life where I'm asking questions, where am I? Where am I experiencing God's love? Where am I resisting love? What voices do I listen to? What audiences do I play for? What patterns of unbelief hold me captive? What doors have I closed? What doors are in my life that I I never even knew I hadn't opened to the Lord? What spaces am I claiming for myself and my own resistance? What parts of myself have I hidden and been unwilling to bring into the bright light of God's grace? I wonder what happens to you if you ask yourself these same questions. We all have contested spaces in our lives. 
Jeremiah suggests that you are where you are because at this very moment, God wants you to find him here. This is the place where I have driven you, the Lord says. Check that door in your life. All right, we noticed that in the text. We noticed a, a second thing. The search for God engages your mind. The search for God engages your mind. As a university church, can we say amen to that? You know, the Lord says, love, love, I want you to love me with your whole mind. And it doesn't mean you're brilliant. It doesn't mean you've got a lot of degrees. It doesn't mean you've been to school at all. But what it does mean is that you use the brain that God has given you to pursue him and to love him. Especially important because Jeremiah says in chapter 17, verse 6, that our mental presets are programmed against perceiving and believing and loving God. The heart, he says, is deceptive. In our text here, he says, seek me with all your heart. Jeremiah 29, 13. The, the word that's translated heart here is also the Hebrew word for mind. It's the same word. This word can be translated heart, mind, understanding, imagination. For example, in Jeremiah 51, 50, uh, he says, let Jerusalem come into your mind. And that's the same word. Uh, often Jeremiah will use this word when he says, you say in your heart. Now he's obviously not talking about an organ there. If he's talking about our inner dialogue, he's talking about the, the way that we speak to ourselves and we in, would, would call that our minds. The heart, mind, understanding, imagination. So the point is, you're, you're not, and I are invited to seek me with all of that, all, all of that, your whole mind, and you will find me. Now here's another picture. A picture for that, for me, is a classroom. Just a kind of an icon of a place where we open our minds, where we challenge our own thinking, where we pursue truth. And here's a classroom in Cambridge. Most of the classes that Ann and I were a part of were much smaller than this, just around a table, just sometimes just a handful of other students. Uh, but this one was standing room only because the man on the right there is a man named John Lennox, and he's a very special man. He's a, a Cambridge PhD, a professor emeritus of mathematics at Oxford. He's also a professor of uh, philosophy of science. He's a Christian. He actually was a student of C.S. Lewis's for a season. And he's engaged in a number of debates over the years with some of uh, the uh, uh, brightest atheists of our day, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitch Hitchens, Peter Singer. Uh, this evening, he was uh, showing us a movie that he's just put out called Against the Tide, Finding God in an Age of Science. I would recommend the film. Uh, after showing the film, he gave us uh, his time for with three hours we were there uh, in a Q&A session. It was fascinating. And John Lennox absolutely believes that the search for God engages your mind. He told us a story, a conversation that he had one of his, with one of his atheist colleagues in the sciences. And he asked his colleague, so um, what instrument do you use for your science? And they referenced the computer that was on the lab table. And uh, he said, no, 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 I'm talking about the instrument you use to formulate hypotheses and to evaluate evidence. And so they say, oh, oh, my brain. And he said, oh, okay, so can you give me a brief history of the brain? And the person kind of went through, well, it's the product of blind and God, uh, unguided random forces. And then Dr. Lennox said, looked at the computer again, so okay, if I told you that that computer on the lab table was the product of blind, random, unguided forces, would you trust it? And of course, the scientist says, no. And he says, well, would you trust your brain if that's all it were? And he says, all the great scientists say no. That our, our, our brains, our minds have to be more than that in order to give us deliverances that we can trust that are f fundamentally credible. So then John Lennox goes on, he says uh, to us, you know, on the other hand, it's so interesting, one of the things that compels his own faith is this idea that the universe can be described by mathematical equations. This is his field. That the math we use fits uh, the universe aptly. This is a rational universe. That there's a rationality behind the rationality of the universe. We live in a word that, uh, that has logic to it, that there is, as the Greeks say, a logos behind it or a word behind it. And, and so because we live in an intelligible universe, uh, people with intelligible minds can sense intelligibility behind it. 
And in fact, this perspective, this narrative, the Christian story is one that gives us confidence in our minds. The point is, God has given you a brain and you need to use it to find God. Especially modern people. Because modern people have been programmed by the Enlightenment to believe that God is somehow distant, that we're insulated from the spiritual world. Charles Taylor's book, which I've shared with you before, came up again and again in these lectures in Cambridge, his book, A Secular Age, and he makes that argument. In other words, our minds are one of the most contested spaces in our lives. I think that's why the Lord says through Jeremiah, all of your heart and mind, all of your mind, the whole thing. He doesn't say just use part of it because in some ways your mind is a contested space. Part of it thinks one way, but another part of it thinks another way. You know what I'm saying? To think with your whole mind means you have to use part of your mind to think about how the other part is thinking because of the cultural programming of our moment. It's not that we have so much unbelief in the secular age, it's just that we don't think God is really relevant because we conceptualize ourselves as completely cut off from the spiritual world. And God is distant, not inter- interfacing at all with human history. We've gotta deprogram that thought. It takes our whole mind to think that through. That's why I went to Cambridge and then later to Regent College in Vancouver, which I also recommend at University of British Columbia, to be in an environment where faithful people are studying, to learn, to push back against my own secular biases. I realize constantly I need to refurbish my own anemic imagination by immersing myself in the biblical text and thoughtful theology. My mind is a contested space. And so one of the practices for thoughtful people is what St. Paul calls taking every thought captive. In 2 Corinthians 10.5, he says this to the church in Corinth, we destroy arguments and every proud obstacle raised up against the knowledge of God and we take every thought captive to obey Christ. What is he talking about? He's not, by the way, I used to think this meant go out and get in arguments with people. He's actually, I don't believe he's talking about other people's arguments, I think he's talking about the arguments that are deeply embedded in our own psyche. This is about contesting my own thinking with the benefit of the good news of Jesus Christ, taking captive every thought in my own head that does not acknowledge the love of God, the work of Jesus Christ, the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in my life and in the world. Take those thoughts captive so that you can love God with your whole mind. So yes, brothers and sisters, many of you, God has given you huge brains, I know that. And if God has given you a brain, don't you dare stop using it to pursue truth in Jesus Christ. We've gotta keep learning, keep growing, keep investigating. Seek me with all your heart, and I will let you find me. Jeremiah suggests that the search for God engages your whole mind. I wonder what the pursuit of truth might look like in your life at this point. Well, we notice that in the text, and there's another thing we notice in the text, and that is prayer. Prayer releases the power and plan of heaven into your everyday life. Oh, this is so important, I hope you hear this. There's a message here in the text, the Lord's saying to Israel, even in exile, even in their lostness, even in the midst of their contested spaces. I mean, it may take a day, a year, 70 years, but he says, you can talk to me. I'm listening right now. And the more you talk, the more your life will change. He says, when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. I will restore. Picture that for me is a a chapel. A chapel is a place of kneeling. It's a place that we come and say, my Lord and my God. It's a place that we say, my maker and redeemer and friend. It's a place that we say, not my will but thine. It's a place of surrender. So here's a picture of a chapel in Cambridge. Uh, This is not actually uh, Ridley Hall. uh, But we came to Cambridge because of Ridley Hall. Ridley Hall is a very faithful evangelical community with long-standing tradition of preparing men and women for service and scholarship in the Church of England. 
And it's a worshiping community. We want to be a part of that. And they practice daily prayer. Every morning and every evening, the bell would ring. We were in the dorm room, just 50 feet away from the chapel. And the bell would ring, and we'd put our toothbrushes down, and we'd run into that chapel, and they'd give us a little prayer book, a 1662 Book of Common Prayer. And we would be there in that chapel for 10, 15, 20 minutes, just reading and working our ways through the prayers. Thomas Cranmer, uh, in the 16th century, wrote the uh, Book of Common Prayer, 1559. It's the first edition of it. And his thought was, you know, let's reclaim the ancient churches, uh, prayers of the early church. And if you read uh, Thomas Cranmer's morning and evening prayer every day, you would read through the whole Psalter every 30 days, every month, just the Psalms is the heart of it. And you'd read through the whole of the Bible every year. It's kind of like our immerse. And to just imagine what it was like at the Reformation to be able to completely immerse yourself in these narratives and pray these prayers with, with David. I mean, it had a powerful effect on me, Ridley. This particular picture that, that I'm showing you here is, is from St. Edward's Church. And if you look carefully, there's a brown wooden structure on the left-hand side, and that's called the Latimer Pulpit. This pulpit was believed to be the place where the first Eng uh, sermon of the English Re Reformation was preached in 1525, Christmas Eve. Uh, a man named Robert Barnes preached an openly evangelical sermon. And this pulpit, the very same pulpit which is used today by a, a former alum of the same grad school that I went to, Gordon Conwell, uh, was used by uh, Thomas Cranmer himself, Hugh Latimer, Nicholas Ridley, Robert Barnes. The last day that we were in Cambridge, we came here. Uh, it's, it's 13th century or older. It's the oldest, one of the oldest churches in Cambridge. And we wanted to have morning communion. It was a Friday morning. And we came in. There were just three or four people off to the side in a little chapel on the side of this. You can kind of see the edge of it here. And we sat down. And there was just an empty lectern. And nobody was there. We waited for the appointed hour. And I could hear this shuffling behind me, these feet very slow, and I could hear what sounded like a dragon, speaking of the year of the dragon, labored breathing, and I turned around, and there's a very thin, very old man, who to me seemed like he might have crawled right out of the crypts. I mean, he might have been there to hear that first Re Reformation sermon, I don't know, but he was, sh it was gonna take him five minutes to get 10 feet from the back to the front, and he came up there and he explained to us that the vicar had other university business today, so there could be no communion, but if we like, he would read the morning prayers for us, and, which he did. And he, it was very British. So he, he, would say, he would say, I wonder if I were to read the odd verses, whether you might like to read the even verses. <laughs> we're like, it was so gentle and kind. And we're like, yes, we will read the even verses if you might like to read the odd verses, you know, very gentlemanly. And then he started to read and this man, uh, he read with such gravitas. I mean, the same words that we had been reading, but uh, he had incorporated these words into his very being, and, he, and he'd say words like ungodly in such a way that you'd think I'd never want to sin again, you know? <laughs> and he'd speak of our dear, uh, he'd speak of King Jesus and your dear son in such a way that you'd think that he was just about to see him himself around the next corner, which he might have. In fact, I wanted to talk to him after the service, but it was over. He was able to somehow disintegrate or evaporate into the crypts again, and I never was able to, to, to find him. I think he was maybe the warden, if, whatever that is. But, but I was just struck as he read um, I, how deeply I was taken into the prayers. And, and I think it, there's no other way to explain that but the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit met me in those prayers. And, and I'm doing more prayer because of that. See, prayer releases the power and plan of heaven into your everyday life. It says, Lord, here's what I'm going through. Lord, here's what the world is going through. I want you to come and, and do something ab about it. Uh, do you know that Daniel was in Babylon at this time? He, he was there. This is uh, uh, 594 B.C. Daniel is there. And Daniel prayed three times a day. It's where the daily office comes from, Daniel's practice of praying. And one day, you can read one of his prayers, by the way, in Daniel chapter 9, but don't stop there. Read Daniel 10 as well, because 10 gives you the, the back end of the story. 
In chapter 10, Daniel gets this visitation from an angel who gives him a vision, and he basically says to Daniel, I know your prayer seems so ordinary, but I gotta tell you, I came from a battle. I've been grappling with the powers of darkness. Me and another angel, we've been holding back the the prince of Persia, and Sue, the prince of Greece is coming, and we're holding, as you pray, you are empowering us for combat in the heavenly places. Don't stop now. Because as you pray, the way things are going in heaven will be the way things go on earth. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Such encouragement for Daniel, and for us, I think, to know, oh, I don't know, do I really have time? Oh, I don't know, does it really do anything? Yes. What does it mean that we're gonna, that we're gonna leave here having asked the Lord to give us our daily bread, to forgive us of our sins, to help us to grow in love for him and love for one another, for our neighbors? It'll, it'll make a difference. I don't know, I can't explain it to you. You say, why doesn't God just do this anyways? It's because of contested spaces. God wants your invitation. In his love for us, he has condescended to us to bind himself so that his agency collaborates with our agency. Blaise Pascal said God has given us the dignity of causality. You see, he he waits for the invitation. And when we invite God to take action in our lives or in the world, he now has the permission that he wants in order to come in and go, boom, all right. Now, now I can, I'm invited into that space and I can work. That's what prayer does. This is where Jesus lit the fire for me on the sabbatical. It was a great start, the Book of Common Prayer. The the immediacy of the Psalms, uh, praying as though God were actively involved in every circumstance of each day, and that he has a plan and and an adventure for me. I mean, I'm continuing to pray the Book of Common Prayer, and Anne is too. By the way, if you'd like to try, there are two apps that really, really help. You don't have to do the page flipping If, if you want. Um, scan this code. I'm going to show you two codes, so get quick. And uh, scan this one for the shorter version, and then the next, this one, <laughs> is the longer version. Maybe we can cycle those back and forth. You can see. But if you get to either page, you'll be able to find the other one. Um, but it will populate the new texts each day, so you'll, you'll be able to move through the Psalms over the course of a month and the rest of Scripture over the course of the year, and you can choose contemporary or traditional. If you're on the radio and you're unable to scan these code, just Google Church of England and Daily Prayer, and a webpage will come up that will give you access to uh, the app stores. Jeremiah suggests that prayer releases the power and plan of heaven into your everyday life. When you call upon me and come and pray to me, he says, I will hear you. I will restore. Wherever you are today, whatever you're going through, God's got you there so you'll find Jesus. He's got you there to find him. Yes, you'll need to use your mind. You'll need to look at the evidence and pursue the truth. He's got you there to follow him. And you've been given the most powerful resource ever deployed in human history. It's not politics, it's not weapons, it's prayer. It's that which allows the creator to bring his redemptive purposes into the creation. Here's what I believe. God has a plan and a purpose and an adventure for each of us in Jesus Christ, in Jesus Christ, each one of us, and all of us collectively here at UPC. Okay, so let me show you one last picture, if you will allow me, with apologies. Here's a picture of our family on an adventure. This is the adventure shot, okay? This is us sailing in the Caribbean. We were down there for two weeks, one week with our family. We rented a boat. This is the first day we rented a boat, okay? It's a big boat. 20 knots of wind that day. They call it the Christmas winds. They were very high. So uh, you got to, you know, everyone's watching at the dock. You gotta t- you've never been on this boat before in your life, right? And you get an audience. You've got to take this boat out of the harbor, raise the sails. We pulled them up, dropped our dock lines, pulled up the sails, and just, just, just lit the fuse and went bam across this sound. And we're thinking, oh, my gosh, will we ever make it back in one piece? So my whole family there, my daughter's not pictured. She's behind the, the, the phone taking the picture. But this is adventure. I mean, we were, adrenaline was pumping. We will never forget this day as, this, as the, the wind p- pushed us out there. Never forget the remaining days either. But I won't tell you, God's got an adventure for each one of us that will make that pale. Just consider the story that you and I are a part of. 
the logic of the cosmos, the logos, has stepped into history, the living word. He's a mediator in our contested space to win a great victory over death and sin and evil on the cross. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He stands in our humanity before our creator, the Heavenly Father, to say, I love you freely, completely, with all of my mind, with all that I am. This is a mature love. And he intercedes for us at the right hand of the Father. He's actually sent his Holy Spirit to intercede within us so that when we can't even find the words, our prayer will move heaven and earth. This is the story that we're in. I, have the, I know the plans I have for you, the Lord says. I've loved you with an everlasting love. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. These are the words of Jeremiah. And then the words of Paul. He chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. We are what he's made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. This is a plan, purpose, adventure. This is where we find it. (laughs) I had an amazing sabbatical. I really did. I had this sense. There was a lot of planning that went into it, but ultimately Jesus was the one who planned. There were things that I just can't account for that were so wonderful and blessed and healed and renewed us. I think the biggest thing that the time away did for us was kind of break the rhythm of our lives and it pulled us out of our context to allow us to see our lives and to kind of reclaim our lives, not as defined by a role or an institution or somebody else's expectations, but as given to us by our loving Lord, just as a child of God, a son or a daughter. We reclaimed our lives, and this gives us the ability then to give them away again, to give them away to Jesus and to his purposes in the world. So I'm back. I'm signed up. I'm ready to go, ready to serve, looking for the adventure with you. And I want to invite you to join me. I already have a sense that the Lord was at work while I was away. Somehow our attendance went up. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what, that, what that says. But um, the Lord's at work, and I, I, I sense that he's at work in your life, too, and I can't wait to hear about that. I hope we'll get a chance to talk about that together uh, sometime in the near future. But I want to invoy, invite you to join me. I just know that when we do what the Lord invited Israel to do via Jeremiah, to invite him into our contested spaces, to pursue him with our whole minds, and to release his power through prayer, I just know our best days are ahead. May we receive the words that Jesus spoke over the church of Philadelphia in Revelations 3, 8, when he said, look, I have set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have but little power and yet you have kept my word. I've set before you an open door. I'm eager to see what doors the Lord is opening for us here at UPC and to walk together through them. To him be the glory, amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we do... We do trust that you've gathered us here today for something special. What a privilege it is to be a part of that. So open our minds and open our hearts to allow us to cherish and to treasure, to marvel at at what you're doing in our lives and in your church around the world. And give us the courage, the same courage we prayed for our friend Naji. Give us the courage to be your messengers, ambassadors, agents of peace here in our own time and place. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. A moment ago, George quoted Jeremiah 31, 3, in which the Lord says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. That's the God that calls us to pray to him, to come to him for healing. I want to invite us to sing a few stanzas of this hymn. As you're able, let's stand as we sing together. Hear, Master, in this quiet place.
time for our healing service and the time for us to consider what is it that we ask of our Savior Jesus Christ. Remember what he asked blind Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? And he sought healing. Uh, I believe Jesus is asking each of us, what do you want me to do for you? Let's pursue healing together. You know, Jesus isn't a religion or a philosophy, a creed or an abstraction. He's a person and he came to make God known. Jesus said, anyone who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come under judgment but has passed from death to life. That's the good news right there. If you don't know Jesus Christ, I'm gonna invite you to come forward today. Talk to one of us about how you can pass from death to life through faith in your Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm gonna invite our prayer team to come forward. This is where healing begins. Uh, But there are so many other ways that we all need healing. Uh, Let's allow Jesus to come and touch our uh, contested places, our broken places, and even the uh, broken spaces of the world. You can come forward for healing for yourself, but also for others. You may be aware of someone in your life that needs healing, or a story somewhere in the world that needs the touch of heaven. Uh, Would you take it upon yourself if the Holy Spirit prompts you to come forward and seek prayer for that? Remember what the brother of Jesus says in the book of James. This is a promise we're claiming today. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. Brothers and sisters, I invite you to come forward as uh, you are led. If someone's moving by, make sure you give them some room to come and share their need uh, confidentially with with these elders and deacons and others on our prayer team. Uh, Even if you're not coming forward, I want to invite you to pray for those who do and pray for yourself as well. Uh, You can have Holy Spirit uh, uh, oil on your, uh, your, the the oil is a sign of the Holy Spirit on your forehead or on your wrist if you prefer that as a sign of God's nearness and healing power. Remember, it's not our wishful thinking that heals us. It's our prayer. Jesus says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you'll find. Knock, and the door will be open to you. Brothers and sisters, come. Let's engage in the ministry of healing together.
we're going to continue here as, as long as people come forward, as long as people want to remain and pray. I don't want anybody to miss an opportunity should the Holy Spirit be nudging you to come. And sometimes we don't have as much faith as we would like to have. And it's just something about leaning on the faith of a brother or a sister in Christ. So if you don't have faith today, that's okay. Come and allow us to have faith for you and, and touch an area in your life, whether that's physical healing or emotional healing or a relationship or financial or something at work. Uh, please take your time this morning. Let's linger together in the healing presence of Jesus. Meantime, I do understand that some of us have to go pick up kiddos or have other tasks to attend to. Um, so I'm going to invite you to stand for a moment, if you're able, and uh, I have a few words of benediction for you. certainly want to say thank you for worshiping with us today. It's so good for me to see your face. Thank you for being uh, on the live stream, on the radio as well. Thank you for your generous giving. Uh, continues to be a need here at UPC as we meet the needs of our neighborhood and our world. Your generosity makes a huge difference. So you can come to upc.org or you can use the boxes in the back. Well, I want to cha charge you this week to open a door in your life, to find a place in your life where you might have some resistance to love and open that door and see what God might do with it. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. And all God's people said, amen. Hey, friends, thank you for uh, worshiping with us today. There are some prayers coming through online, and it is a joy to pray with you. So um, we're going to leave this online chat um, open. And so if you would like prayer, go ahead and hit that pray now button or there's another request prayer button in there. And you can also just email us at prayer at upc.org. I know that that lacks a personal element, but our prayer team receives them, reads them and prays for them faithfully. And so um, with that, bless you and um, have a wonderful week. And we will see you next Sunday. We get to kick off a new series. Oh, and Lent. So we'll see you on Wednesday. Bye.